Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. David, to start off, what led you to dedicate four years of research into the history of Germany's wealthiest families? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all started off when I, in, the, in late 2011, I started as a, a reporter for um, Bloomberg News in New York on an investigative team that covered family-owned companies, family offices. Um, and actually, I was hired as one of the U.S. reporters. Uh, it was a new team, which was started in the wake of, of Occupy Wall Street, basically, and to investigate hidden wealth. But they soon asked me, because I'm Dutch, oh, my American bosses, oh, can't you also cover the uh, German-speaking countries? Because to my American bosses, it was like, oh, this Dutch guy, I'm sure he speaks fluent German. And um, which, which, which I did not um, at the time, but I, you know, I delve in. And what I would do is I would spend a month a year uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas in the Bloomberg bureaus in Germany, in uh, Austria and Switzerland. And the stories I always came back with were, the, were this mix of the financial, the historical and the, um, uh, yeah, and the business side of things. And what really struck me in my reporting was that companies like BMW um, or Porsche or Dr. Utker would celebrate their fathers and grandfathers for their business successes, but leave out any mention of their war crimes or Nazi affiliations after they had purported to have reckoned with these crimes. So... You know, their names would be on, you know, massive global charitable foundations, media prizes, um, uh, corporate headquarters, um, academic chairs, uh, you name it. And, uh, you know, I found this such, I found that kind of that, that, that subtle cover-up of history, I found that such a, a brazen whitewash that I wanted to shine a light on it. So initially I started writing... Um, articles about it for Bloomberg, um, you know, about the Quant family, which is the, the main family in the book, which are the controlling shareholders of the BMW Group, uh, on the Flick dynasty, which are the former controlling shareholders of Daimler-Benz, and on the Utker dynasty. And then, you know, my colleagues at some point said, uh, you should write a book about this. So then I developed a, a book proposal and then got picked up by a publisher in the U.S. And then with that, I moved to Berlin to dedicate three or four years of my life to researching and writing uh, the book. And when researching and writing, I can imagine it's a lot of reading yeah. that you had to do. How did you then gather all the materials yeah. for the book? So, so I had a really great office in, in Prenzlauer Berg on Schönhauser Allee, where I had my little Nazi business library, which... Didn't own, it wasn't only hundreds of, a, yeah, I would say you know, it was hundreds of books, uh, you know, both secondary sources in terms of studies, but a lot of prima, primary, uh, primary sources, uh, you know, in addition to memoirs, um, diaries, and biographies. Um, it was a lot of, uh, of course, it was a huge amount of archival material, both in Germany and, and, and I did a lot of archival research in the U.S. as well. A lot of the archives have been digitized, um, so... But yeah. were they public access, or did you have to, in some cases, look further for some information? Um, well, one, one really goldmine of, 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 of sources were um, German anti, uh, antiquariats, which have, which uh, you could... For example, one of the main characters in the book, Günter Quant, the patriarch of the Quant dynasty, had, like, letters from 1936 that were published or like in uh, published in limited edition mm -hmm. and he you know uh, you can get a glimpse into kind of his uh, you know uh, his, his, his less pleasant views on, on racial relationships and and kind of very much you know kind of standard for for um, thinking in, in 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 big business or in bourgeois circles at, in, in Germany at the time and I could order them from like a German antiquariat and, and, and things like that. There were like troves of, you know, documents also. I mean, some of them have, because some of these families have commissioned studies, 
part of their archives are accessible in certain in in certain uh, regional archives. So, mm -hmm. for example, the Flick archive is in the Berlin Brandenburg uh, uh, business archive. But to go there, you have to go to the you have to first make an appointment. And you have to go to the mo most northwestern corner of Berlin uh, in the most in like an industrial area. And there's a back entrance. You go up three stairs. And then you know it's they don't make they make the threshold of access quite high, quite good. high, right? So you have to, uh, yeah, it's it's um, yeah yeah it, it takes a while. You have to be persistent and um, yeah because uh, it, it it's a kind of a it's public access, but it's not that public of an access. Well, and throughout this entire process, what would you say was one of the biggest challenges that you encountered when writing the book? It was the sheer amount of information mm -hmm. to, you know, focusing on, I mean, the contemporary criteria of why I chose these five families to write about were that they are still relevant in global business uh, today. And so a lot of people ask me, oh, why didn't you write about the Thyssen or the Krupp dynasty? Because they're not, they're not, they don't, they're not, they, well, the Krupp dynasty has died out and the Thyssens have, have uh, you know, um, have sold their shares in, in, in Tissen before it merged with Tissen Group, before it merged with Krupp in the early 1990s, and they literally live on a pampa somewhere in Argenti mm -hmm. Argentina, and, and they don't they don't play a role of of relevance in global business. So the five fam five dynasties I wrote about still play a role in in, in global business today, either through their uh, consumer facing brands or through investing billions through their family offices. Um, they. You know, were also their fathers and grandfathers were also some of the largest profiteers of the Third Reich here through massive arms production, through the Aryanization of, of Jewish owned businesses and the expropriation of businesses in, in German occupied territories, as well as the mass exploitation of, of, of forced and slave labor um, during World War II. And of course what, what is what was key to all to all of it is that they all in some subtle, insidious way cover up uh, history mm -hmm. or, or, or whitewash history in a way that it makes it, you know, relevant and, and, and uh, enough to, 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 to showcase a larger issue at hand of the, yeah, whitewash you know, of the from history. From how you describe it, it uh, wasn't an easy task. And I'm sure that uh, you faced a lot of challenges while doing all of this research. But what motivated you to keep on going? I think... You know, of course, you come across the most, uh, also in, in the research, across the most, the most horrific, horrific side of, of humankind, right? But I think that also motivated me, that motivated me to keep going, to get the story out there. And um, it, you know, going, going back to your question, I mean, what was, of course, incredibly difficult in addition to the sheer amount of information was that you know, I'm Dutch, I'm writing a book in English based on what is mostly German source material on a, top, on a topic that's still extremely sensitive uh, and secretive uh, today. So it is, you know, being extremely diligent along the way. Uh, you know, I had a really great uh, research assistant, uh, Pauline, who, you know, uh, was also the fact checker on, of the book. You know, and 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 she, you saved me uh, from from mistakes on on many occasions. So it's it 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 was yeah it was. Uh, I guess part of it is is, is yeah it, it mainly it, it, the motivation is is it wanting having this deep desire to get the story out there, which keeps you going day in day out. And I do have to say, you know, the pandemic helped it for me in a way because it 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 it, it allowed me to really focus for a year and a half and, and, and I could go to the office every day, uh, you know, and even though the streets of Berlin were empty and I could just, you know, stay day in, day out, work at, work at it, yeah. You know, you already uh, touched upon this topic, but before we jump into the book, sure. could you briefly in two sentences describe what or rather who are Nazi billionaires? So the Nazi billionaires in the book are so first and foremost, it's a quant dynasty, 
which are today the controlling shareholders of BMW Group, which is not only BMW, but also Mini and Rolls-Royce. Um, is one branch of the family. There's another branch, but that's the main branch of the family. Flick Dynasty, former controlling shareholders of Daimler-Benz. The Von Fink Dynasty, which is the founding families of Allianz and Munich Re, and also this private bank called Merck Fink. Um, there is a Porsche Pierre family, which of course, in addition to being the founding families behind Volkswagen and, and Porsche, they also control today Audi, Skoda, Seat, Lamborghini, Bentley, many other car brands. And fifthly, it's the Utker uh, dynasty, of, of the mainly known of, uh, particularly among students, for uh, their frozen, frozen pizzas and their um, um, pudding mixes and their cake mixes. Uh, but they also own Germany's largest beer brewer. Uh, they were the large shareholders in Hamburg Süd, which is one of the biggest uh, shipping companies in the world. Um, uh, also private bank, a whole range of, of luxury hotels. And at the end of the book, I also give a, a counterexample of the Raimann dynasty, um, which uh, kind of to end the book on a positive note, which owns, you know, tens of consumers, some of the most well-known consumer brands uh, in the world. Um, but they uh, managed to do something positive. Uh, mm -hmm. when they were confronted with their dark history. And th I think you, you'll also be, have time later on in the interview to further elaborate on sure. that. But out of curiosity in the audience today, who here knew that the Quant family is one of the main uh, shareholders of BMW? Okay, a few hands, but I gather not everyone. Uh, a lot of things, personally, I had to learn through reading this book, and, and I think this says a lot about just public information and access to this information. Um, but before we also go further, could you briefly give a summary of who the Quant family were um, pr prior to Hitler's regime? So, yeah, Günther Quant was the was the patriarch of the of the Quant dynasty, and he came from a textile uh, manufacturing family in in Brandenburg, outside of outside of Berlin, um, and he. They basically made their money, like a, a lot of them, they, I mean, they were already very wealthy prior to World War I. But really, World War I, uh, you know, being a main manufacturer for the, uh, for the, for the, for the German, for the uh, Imperial Army, um, you know, they benefited a lot already from, from death and, 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 and destruction. And, and of course, you know, so many, um, of course, of the garb, the uniforms came back, uh, you know, they had to be replaced, so they had huge profits, um, just like Friedrich Flick, the other main character as well, um, you know, uh, producing for the steel industry, producing for the weapons industry, so it's really the upswing of the of the World War The war benefited one. them, in other words. Yeah, but, it, but they really consolidated their wealth during the, during the Weimar, during the hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic, mm -hmm. where they were able to buy up you know, uh, massive companies on, 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 you know, pennies on the dollar. And that, that power was further consolidated, you know, once Hitler seized power uh, in, uh, on January 30th, 1933, where they made this devil's pact with Hitler, initially with, you know, the mass rearmament of Nazi Germany. And how did Hitler convince Günther Quant and such billionaires to support his regime? Well, I mean, this was the tail end of the Great Depression. And these men, you know, the men I write about, for the most part, were, were sheer opportunists. They wanted to expand their, their business empires and their, you know, their fortunes at all costs, right? Without any regard for human lives or human livelihood. So what, what Hitler promised them and what he also initially delivered on was that he was going to initiate the, the largest rearmament program that the world had ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, their, co their companies were in jeopardy. Um, you know, millions in Germany were unemployed. Um, the Weimar Republic was a time of extreme political and economic volatility. So they, you know, they had no qualms kind of signing over German democracy um, in order to benefit themselves and their companies and their bottom lines. Mm -hmm. um, it was an opportune. It was an opportune decision. It was not an ideological decision, on the part of again most of the main characters in my book. There were mm -hmm. a few ideologues as well. Would you say they had a choice whether or not to support? They it? certainly had a choice. They certainly had a choice. I give the example of Fritz Thyssen in the book. Fritz Thyssen was um, 
of the Thyssen uh, steel empire, uh, the main air, and was one of was one of Hitler's first industrial and one of basically only industrialist backer from 1925 onwards. So really an ideologue. And in 1939, he decided to, uh, as a thank you for his kind of his backing of Hitler, he was made an honorary member of parliament, right, in the defunct Reichstag. And in 1939, for some you know, symbolic reason, he decided to vote against the German invasion of Poland. And of course, as a result, he had to flee um, uh, he settled first in, in, in Paris, where he had this American journalist write, wrote this whitewashing autobiography of him called I Paid Hitler. Um, but then he was arrested after the German invasion of France, and he was put in a concentration camp for three and a half years. And the irony is that after the war, because he had been such a public backer of Hitler, the Allies also uh, indicted him, so he was twice convicted. And of course, his entire steel empire was expropriated. Now, certainly, you know, uh, as an ideal, I mean, he, he, uh, he was very much aware of the consequences, what would happen if he would vote, if he would take a stand against Hitler. So for all those, for the Günther Quanz and the Friedrich Flicks who said, I did not have a choice. Yeah, they did have a choice. They, they, they could stand up. Were there consequences? Of course, yeah, they would, have, they would lose their business empires. They just decide to stay and profit. And you know what, while reading the book, uh, I myself was wondering if they didn't donate to the regime to Hitler, right. would they still have come into power? Yes, yes. I mean, I think if, 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 if the, the um, I mean, I start the book with this meeting on February 20th, 1933, with Hitler and Goering summon uh, two dozen of of, of Germany's uh, biggest industrialist financiers, um, business heirs and, 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 and CEOs and other executives. And they're basically asked to, to fund the last election campaign for the next 10 to 100 years. So what they are promised is explicitly the end of German democracy. And again, they have no qualms taking out their checkbooks and, and, and signing over uh, the end of, 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 of German democracy. But had it not been for them, there would have been two dozen others mm. who would have who would have ta who would have done the same who you know mm. who would have been waiting in the wings to take their positions. Um, there would have not been, uh, you know, I don't think there would have been a uh, a scenario where there would not be business backing for for what Hitler promised them, which is again right was it was an economic and and, and financial promise uh, in addition to to everything else because in the speech he didn't speak yet about the exclusion of Jews from 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 the German uh, life, or initially, uh, you know, uh, German economic life, um, or, or you know, he wrote about he, he he spoke about the struggle between the right and the left, but, but the main promise to them was was an economic one, and that's what they bought into. And that's essentially what they did, right? They they also grew their businesses during the Hitler reign, um, and in fact, the documentary "The Silent of the Quants" concluded that the role of the Quant family businesses during the Second World War were linked inseparably with the crimes of the Nazis. Do you agree with that? Oh, totally, absolutely. And yeah. could you elaborate? Like sure, I mean, uh, Günther Quandt, who at that point in time controlled one of the largest armaments uh, manufacturers of, of the Third Reich, as well as one of the largest battery and, and accumulator um, uh, companies, AFA, which today is known as Varta, which produces the uh, batteries in your airports. Um, you know, they, in addition to, to the, the, the so-called Aryanizations that, that, that Günther Quandt and his son Herbert Quandt had done in the 1930s um, of Jewish business families, um, um, uh, followed up by the expropriation, the mass expropriation of you know, uh, businesses in German-occupied territories, and being one of the largest arms producers, they, you know, mass exploited that um, in Günther Quandt and Herbert Quandt's factories, there were almost 60,000 forced and slave laborers, including thousands of concentration camp captives. Mm -hmm. Now, for, for, an, for an individual, for a individual mogul to exploit to that, num to exploit that number of, of, of forced and slave laborers, um, in private business was it was was huge. I mean, on the same scale, you had Friedrich Flick, who was later in that the only one of my main characters to be indicted and 
convicted at, at Nuremberg, you know, who had who had doubled the amount, right? Um, uh, Krupp, uh, also around 100,000, but these were really the main, these were in private business, these, were, these three were really the main perpetrators in, in terms of the exploitation of, uh, of, of, of forced and slave laborers, but also, um, you know, in terms of profiteering. Yeah. Um, but yeah. what we see connecting to that is that during the denazification process, guided by Western allies, most of these families were let off by merely paying fines. Why did the world let, it, w let them get away with their crimes? I mean, these were Cold War considerations. It was political expediency on the part of the US, which were leading in this, right? I mean, post-war, the UK was weak, France was weak, um, and you know, with the emergence of the Cold War from early 1947 onwards, you know, for the US, uh, the Nazi regime and, um, uh, and, and Nazis became ancient history. And the priority became the rebuilding of Germany, uh, of Western Germany as a democratic, viable, and, and uh, you know, and solid and, 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 and strong economic state. So they prioritize the rebuilding over their past? Uh, oh, well, over, over, over punishment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, they made the decision to hand over hundreds of thousands of suspected Nazi war criminals and uh, Nazi sympathizers back to West German authorities, who, of course, had no incentive to, uh, you know, to meet, uh, to, to judge their fellow compatriots on crimes that they had committed themselves and on sympathies that they had held themselves. So these so-called de de denazification processes became show trials and not in the way of, of Nazi Germany or, or Stalin's Russia where people were, you know, executed after show trials, but in a way that they would all get off scot-free uh, or slap on the wrist after having been, you know, ever having been responsible uh, for the largest, you know, for some of the uh, mm -hmm. most horrific crimes of the Third Reich. And do you think that West Germany's economic miracle would have been achieved without the help of those industrialists? No, it wouldn't have been achieved without the help of those industrialists. But the, the question more is, you know, there's this five, five years vacuum, right, between 1945 mm -hmm. and 1950, where, where the U.S. basically decides that, that the that German business as a whole can, can continue to exist. Right, right, and where also assets that had been stolen or expropriated could be kept. You know, of course, there was legal recourse, right? But there was not the Allied, uh, um, the Allied authorities uh, after um, the industrialists or the financiers went through denazification. The they got their board positions back. They got their companies back. You know, assets were frozen prior to that. But as soon as you had the the bill, the the the, the yeah the the Bill of the clean slate of health. Basically, you could go, uh, you could go work, um, you could go take back control of your companies. Whereas, of course, in Soviet-occupied uh, East Germany, you know, they were wholesale expropriated mm -hmm. without any question. So there's also this irony that 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 they were they, they were allowed to keep everything, and then from 1915 onwards, uh, it was just business as usual. So they were let go, but. Uh have the Quant family, or for that sake, any of other billionaire families, publicly acknowledge their historical involvement? Yeah, there's been a, there's a, been a, there's been a certain kind of of acknowledgement. Question mark. <laughs> I mean, you know, there has been you know some broad acknowledgement. There hasn't been like explicit mm -hmm. apologies or anything. But what they've what they did, what, what German business as a whole, how they kind of bought off the whole issue, was in 1999, the Clinton administration and the German federal government, then under Gerhard Schroeder, uh, came to this whole, to, to the settlement for the, uh, the compensating of surviving forced and slave laborers. And in that settlement, um, which would pay out 10 billion euros, 5 billion euros was paid up by German business, 5 billion euros was paid up by uh, the German federal government. And the highest payout was to surviving concentration camp captives who, get, who got 7,620 7, euros, which is a pittance, right? 
But there's a clause in that settlement which says that German business as a whole does not need to admit any kind of culpability, wrong, wrongdoing, or admit any kind of guilt. So, so they paid money, but they never had to take any kind of moral responsibility for history. And that is also the reason why I ended up writing the book, because in the two decades since that settlement, or the 25 years almost since that settlement, um, you know, with that release clause, basically, German business could pretend that nothing had happened. They were free. They didn't have to take responsibility for the crimes. So uh, that is also what I think has led these families um, to cover up history. Because then, if you don't need to take, if you don't feel forced or obligated to take responsibility for history, then you don't need to show it, right? Then, on, on that note, then, do you think, and in, in your opinion, then how much responsibility do the descendants of these dynasties hold for the actions of? Their grandparents, great grandparents. None, nothing for the for the actions. They don't hold. They don't responsible for the actions of their fathers mm -hmm. and grandfathers. But what they are responsible for is the enormous wealth that they've inherited, right? Which, in part, right, not in majority, but in part, was built on the backs of of, of forced and slave labor and of Aryanization and expropriation and and death and destruction. But what they but that is something that they don't. That is something that they 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 don't acknowledge, or at, at least not in a transparent way. And that is something that they failed to to take historical and moral responsibility for. So, what would be then right to demand from these families today? Would it be acknowledgement, or? Yeah, it would be. Listen, if you if you if you continue in a time of. In, in, exceptional misinformation, right? Um, to have, you know, massive global charitable foundations, media prizes, etc., in the name of men who committed um, war crimes on a major scale, but fail to acknowledge them in a public and transparent way to, whether it's to consumers or to recipients or uh, recipients of prizes or of money, you know, uh, it is, you only learn from history by showing the good and the bad. And by by showing the good, uh, by only showing the good, it's it's just a cover up. And if they don't want to do that, then they should rename it. But the argument is in favor of radical transparency: is to own up to history. Mm -hmm. um, if you so need to, to 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 call all these institutions after men who committed war crimes, right? And it is very hard to change to make changes for when it comes to private individuals to force private individuals or private companies or family offices to enact changes. I mean, what you could do is you can buy a share of, of BMW or of Porsche and go to the uh, annual general meeting and, and say, you know, and say the question, for example, that, is, that, that would be one way of doing it. But it is, again, it's through public scrutiny, whether it is to, through media or the press or journalism um, or, you know, through grassroots initiatives. That, that this kind of power is, is, is held to account, right? This, it, it, again, the book is, it's not about, it's not about money, it's not about money because for the, for the by, by, uh, by and large, you know, these restitution and compensation cases uh, 78 years onwards have been, have been concluded, mm -hmm. even though there's still a lot of court cases going on with regards to real estate and, and, and art. Um, and out of curiosity, when, in your last pages of your book, uh, you write that members of almost all the German business dynasties detailed in this book declined yeah. to comment or be interviewed. Mm -hmm. Since the publication, has that changed? No, it hasn't changed. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I, nobody's reached out to me directly. Um, Are you surprised by that? No, no, really, because what they want is for this topic to go away. They mm -hmm. want to ignore it, right? So I didn't, they never, ever, I always get the question, did, 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 did they send lawyers after me? No, because that would be, their, from their perspective, the worst PR strategy. Because what, what they want to do is, is they want to sweep, sweep it under the rug. They want to cover it up. So to go after a foreign journalist with a high-powered lawyer is, is, is the worst kind of business. And, and these families, you know, um, they're very, they're very uh, discreet, they're very private, they pride themselves on their privacy. Um, you know, there's been some major changes as a result of the book, 
but 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 nothing that you know they didn't reach out of me directly. They didn't reach to me. So there have right. been no developments in terms of uh, public disclosure or company statements. Oh, there have yes, there have been. There have been. Um, so for example, Porsche had a massive IPO last year, and it just by coincidence it happened to be that their IP, they were listed at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange for about 70 billion euros in late September 2022, early October 2022. My book came out in April 2022, and it also details the fate of Adolf Rosenberger, who's a Jewish co-founder of Porsche, whose stake was Aryanized far below market value. Uh, in 1935, he was subsequently pushed out of the company, and he was erased from Porsche history. And on the background, you know, lawyers had already been negotiating for a kind of a, a moral uh, settlement, because Adolf Rosenberger had settled in 1950. He was paid off a 50,000 uh, Deutsche Mark and a choice between a Volkswagen Beetle and a, a new Porsche sports car. So again, a pittance, right, for 10% shares of a company that's now worth 70 billion euros. But when my book came out, and particularly, they were, there was a so-called roadshow, which you do for an IPO before you go public, when you meet with institutional investors all across the world, US, UK, Middle East, Asia, etc. And, you know, the, my book was published and I uh, wrote a column for the New York Times, which was read by a lot of people. And then, you know, they would get the questions saying, oh, if you're going to lie about your history, are you also going to lie about your financials, particularly in the US and the UK, right? And so they decided to clean house and they came to a settlement with the heirs of Adolf Rosenberger, um, who live in Claremont, California, uh, to rewrite, it's, again, it's a moral, it's a moral, set, it's a moral restitution, to rewrite Adolf Rosenberger back into the history of Porsche, to give him his rightful place back in history. So that's one of the major developments. The other one is regards the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant, mm -hmm. which uh, you know is in the name of the man who uh, saved BMW from bankruptcy and made his two children the, the wealthiest in, in in Germany and in Europe, um, but who also you know built a, a sub-concentration camp on German, in German-occupied Poland, exploited thousands of forced and slave laborers in uh, battery factories in Berlin, including hundreds of female concentration camp, camp captives, um, acquired companies stolen from Jews. Today, you have a massive BMW foundation in the name of Herbert Quant, uh, model inspire responsible leadership. And, you know, after the book was published, you know, fellows all across the world who had received money in the name of Herbert Quant were furious for having been lied to about what a man Herbert Quant was. So BMW appointed an external lawyer in Munich uh, earlier this year to advise on a name change, uh, and that is in the late processes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So we see little changes, sort of. Yeah, but, but, but little, it, particularly in a German context, Little little changes are major steps for mm -hmm. for for you know a, comp a, a a country and companies which are still so deeply conservative, so hierarchical, where change is not a where to enact change is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so you know in German in 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 the German context these are these are li these are massive changes and really li with light year speed. Um, and David, we we speak about these inhumane things that families have done the horrors that they've sponsored. Yet in the book, you are able to write their stories in quite a personal and, and in a way, lively way, where you discuss their love quarrels, their family dynamics, business deals. Was it difficult for you to humanize these people when writing the book? I, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily feel that I humanize them that much. But I don't know, I just described, I mean, based on the source material that I found, you know, I tried to also paint a picture of the characters that we are dealing with, which in many ways were such one-dimensional men, right? They only cared about it was business. They didn't really care about their children. They didn't really care about their families. They cared about their companies and about ex expanding their, their... They didn't even care that much about money. Money was just like a nice extra. They just cared about building a massive empire at all costs. So these men were so one-dimensional, and in order, you know, I, I didn't write a book, I didn't write an academic book, I wrote a book of journal based on, you know, rigorous research, but it's a, it's a journalistic book. You know, you also have to build up your character, so you try what you do to kind of give color 
and some life to to these to these characters. Um, so it wasn't hard to do, to do because it was also something I just basically had to do in order to you know uh, you know make it make it an uh, appealing narrative of of, of, of journalistic nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, at this point, I think it's a perfect time to uh, open some audience questions. Are there currently any audience questions in the house? Nice we have... Hello, hello. Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering, as a German, um, I haven't really experienced a lot of media coverage about the issue to the extent that I would expect hearing about it and also uh, with us priding ourselves as very reflective mm -hmm. about the past. Uh, why do you think that is? Why is there no real discourse about the past um, of these companies in the German public media? Yeah, good. I mean, good question. I mean, there has been in terms of, if you just look at the the impact it had uh, in Germany in terms of both commercial success and the amount of editions, right? Um, um, there's been three separate editions in, Ger in, in, in German. There's been the, the, the main edition by Kiepen, Hoyer and Veitch. Um, then there's been a limited edition by um, uh, Buch Verlag Gutenberg. And there's been, most importantly, the German federal government, the BBP, um, uh, issued a five euro edition uh, of the book uh, last month. Um, also, it was, you know, uh, number one on the side bestseller list. So, so it has done incredibly well. However, in terms of public debate, I'm actually heading to Munich tomorrow to, 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 to give another talk at Villa Stück about uh, the Nazi, um, uh, about Germany's Nazi past at large. I mean, the German public is, of course, still to this day inundated, right, with, with, uh, with daily, um, you know, uh, daily news on some kind of revelation, daily revelations on some kind of aspect of Germany's uh, Third Reich history. Um, you know, I would argue, and also the reason that, that I would argue that the German public is slightly desensitized by yet another revelation with regards to a Third Reich history. Now, as far as, you know, I think these families in a way also kind of lean on German guilt and culpability to bury the subject. Because what happens, right, if a scandal breaks and beloved patriarch X or beloved company Z, uh, Nazi history is revealed? They immediately go into kind of PR crisis mode and said, okay, we're going to open our archives, we're going to uh, commission an independent study by a well-known, by an uh, esteemed historian, which totally pacifies the subject. Four years later, a study is published, right, in, in 1,200 plus pages in dense academic German, and which never reach a wider German audience, right? It's only discussed in academic cir circles. There's never any translation of these studies, so, so uh, people outside of Germany don't really have, they don't have access to it or to the details or surviving heirs of, of forced and slave laborers, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, but the families or the companies can now say, look, it's all in there, it's all in this book, you know, 1,200, 1,600 pages. But they can, it, it kind of, it's hiding the, the subject in plain sight. And because it's not public knowledge, you can continue on a, on a, on a global level, on a consumer facing level, you can again continue to, to go on like nothing's happened. So I think, uh, or continuing the cover, the historical cover up or the lack of transparency. And I think all these factors, of course, play a large role in that as a topic of daily discussion or like kind of a, a you know, of, 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 yeah, of, of, of a kind of um, a paradigm shift. I mean, that's so hard to establish as well in Germany, right? Because at its core, again, I mean, these families, these companies, you know, and German society, it, it's, it's also, Germany, as you know much better than I do, is not a, is not a country where 
power is easily assailed. You know, and that is still that is still the, you know, these families are also the largest do annual donors, the uh, Kwans and the Utkers to the CDU, to the CDU, for example. It, it's 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 a. Uh, it, it, I think the real power, it, the real the real shift would be that, you know, uh, that 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 power is more questioned in Germany or in a more in a more openly and critical way, and 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 um, and yeah, that it, that is yet to happen. Even though, it, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll see that happen in the, in, in the decades to come. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, we'll have another round of uh, questions later on. Now, shifting our focus to present, does the Quant family and such Nazi billionaire families, do they have any power in politics today? Um, yes, I mean, I mean, what, what they've been for decades, they've already been the largest annual donors to the CDU. Um, you know, they have incredible economic power by controlling 47% of BMW, which is, of course, you know, one of the, you know, the car industry, arguably, even though its, it's, it's transition hasn't gone very well to new energy, is still the backbone, together with the chemical and the industrial uh, and the Mittelstand, um, the family-owned uh, uh, companies in Germany, is the backbone of the German economy. So per... It's, al it's also, you know, in a country where, of course, re remembrance culture is so lauded, right? Rightfully so. You, like in many societies, you see the most powerful actors of, uh, of said society who think that the rules of the, so the societal rules do not apply to them. And you see that with these families where they're paying lip service to that remembrance culture. Um, and, and where nobody dares to question them, right? Or where, where it's very hard to question them. And another question I always ask is, why did you write this book, right? Why did it take a Dutch guy to write, to write a book about German, about, about, about these families? Um, because it's also very hard for German journalists, let alone taking outside to account German's quite strict press law. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's very hard to, in a hierarchical and, and, and culturally conservative country, to go after the most powerful families and then, and then in, in, in book form, and then, you know, they would ask, so, but what did your father and grandfather do during the Third Reich, and who are you to question us? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I guess I, it, it took an outsider also to... to, to break this story on a global scale. And also, well, one of the things I found really important was also, you know, the book has now been translated into 15 languages. There's, uh, th there's you know, there will be a total so far of more than 20 translations forthcoming, but it's particularly important in countries where you know, some of which had some of the largest deportations of forced enslaved laborers, like whether it's Poland or Ukraine uh, or, or, or many other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, that they have access in their own uh, language now to these stories because a lot of them never had access to kind of the big picture or the details mm -hmm. of what happened to their families. So it's a, a way of also giving them the backstory and explaining history. Um, yeah from this perspective yes. that's often hidden. And do you think that maybe increased public awareness and scrutiny of wealthy individuals could also encourage some forms of change? I mean, I think that is the most important. <laughs> yeah, of course, as a journalist, I'm not gonna say anything. I mean, I mean that is the, it is the public scrutiny mm -hmm. um, through, you know, journalistic media revelations that, 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 holds, this, that holds truth to power, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, yeah, I think. And um, just taking a step back and looking more broadly, in one of your sure. previous interviews, you have also indicated the similarity between Nazi billionaires with present-day present Russian oligarchs. Yes, absolutely. Could you elaborate on what parallels that can be drawn between them? I mean, just as the Weimar Republic, where, where the German industrialists, you know, acquired their, their, their companies for pennies on the dollar, 
during the hyperinflation era of the Weimar Republic, so did the Russian oligarchs, of course, did the same in, in, in Putin, in, in, Yel in Yeltsin's Russia of, of the 1990s. And just as the German industrialists consolidated, consolidated their power uh, in 1933 with their devil's pact with Hitler, so did the Russian oligarchs do the same from the early 2000s onwards uh, with, with, with Vladimir Putin. And you see, you know, of course by now, Putin's reign has been, you know, almost double that of, of, of Hitler. So it's, it's, it's his power is, it was far, is far more global. It's far more entrenched. Sanctions not working. Um, a lot of global companies are staying in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certainly, particularly in the beginning part, the parallels to the Weimar Republic and, and, and Yeltsin's Russia uh, and, and the consolidation of power under, you know, under dictators is, mm -hmm. is really uncanny. But to focus and the profiteering too, as well. To yeah. focus specifically on those oligarchs, yeah. in your opinion, should they be held uh, criminally liable? Absolutely. If there, if there is, an, is, if there, you know, if, if, if it is to be revealed that whether it is uh, since the uh, Russian um, invasion of Ukraine initially in 2014 and, and from 2022 onwards, you know, if they have in any way profited of war crimes, crimes against humanity, they should be held. They should be held. They should be held criminally to account. There's no question about that. They have, uh, you know, whether they're they're commodities companies or which it is for the large the large part, or consumer companies, have in any way financed uh, or profited from 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 war crimes. They should be totally held to account. Absolutely. Yes. In that case, uh, my question would be. Uh, with an understanding of the Nazi period, yeah. how can we address the problem of those wealthy individuals supporting authoritarian regimes today? I mean, the most important thing, right, is that for the oligarchs to be held fully to account, you know, uh, the political, the, 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 wi the winds that the political, that the political changes, you know, the shift in political changes is gonna be a large part of that. You know, I think the fear on everybody's mind, of course, in 2024, is that Trump is going to be re-elected in the U.S. What would that do in case of a, you know, of, 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 of holding not only Russian oligarchs to account, but the, the, the Russian regime, Putin and, and, and his regime to account, were a war come to an end in, in, in whatever shape or form that might be? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's the, uh, but bar that, it wouldn't be, you know, we have, there's so many institutions, particularly in the Netherlands, that are, that are on a global scale, are so well equipped to uh, indict and, and, you know, uh, punish those who have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. That's why these institutions are there. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and for these, and, and they are also liable to, to political change, right? Because I think the U.S. isn't par, uh, party to the ICC, uh, ne neither is Israel, uh, you know, just to name a few examples. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, and it may be an independent, I mean, I, I know people are already talking about it, a Nuremberg-style kind of tribunal um, um, uh, post, you know, uh, once the Russian invasion of Ukraine ends. Mm -hmm. And and whether that will be held in the Netherlands or or elsewhere or elsewhere, is to be seen. But that is the way that it's in my view the way to go. And I guess the first step, as what your book also indicates, is to talk about these war crimes committed by wealthy individuals who sponsor regimes absolutely and, and sponsor absolutely. these kind of atrocities. Yeah. Um, that said, we have one more time for one more question. Do we have one? We have one at the very back. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question. So essentially, due to the Third Reich and, and yeah, um, there's been a massive power inequality created in Germany, right? So those who chose not to join the regime chose not to gain power and wealth, and those who joined did so to secure power and wealth. So 
we're still left with that structure of inequality in the society today. I'm wondering, A, if that's something you're interested in researching further, B, if um, you've identified any, any legal instruments to counteract this, to deconstruct this um, from here on. Um, and, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm also interested if you, well, no, I'll just leave it at that. That's too much. So could you repeat the yeah. main question, please? There's two questions. Yeah. I mean, I can repeat them as well. Yeah. I think he knows. Yeah. So essentially, like, with the, yeah, with the inequality created in the society today, like, what ways are there to rectify that or to right. deconstruct that? And is that something that you're interested mm. in researching further? But then I guess my other question would be like, what sort of reparations do you think are still due? So, so to your first question, right? It, I guess it's important to, to one of the myths I also tried to dispel of this book was that these families created all of their wealth during the Third Reich. With the exception of the poor Shapir family, which really laid the foundation of their wealth um, uh, under the Nazi regime, all these families were already extremely wealthy prior to Hitler seizing power, right? They, they, they were wealthy in the German Empire, in the Weimar Republic, and they rose in the Third Reich, in uh, occupied West Germany, while well, there was this five-year vacuum, uh, then in, in, in West Germany and in reunified Germany, right? It is, it is, uh, it's the continuous ascent. When it comes to you know, inequality in, in Germany, it is, it, is, it is what happened, of course, with the separation of West Germany and East Germany, that is the where there is still so much research to be done. The, um, the, um, the institution of the Treuhand, uh, which was basically the West German administration that took over East German companies, right, and where massive wealth was sucked out of of of. Uh, of East Germany post post reunification from 1991 onwards, I would say that is really the the most fascinating question. And to your second question about legal instruments, I mean, these legal instruments have been there since 1945, right? The the, re, the legal recourse of restitution, uh, compensation, um, and um, a missing one, but so. So I would say those are, you know, those are still there for those that, for those um, heirs or um, of, of of companies that had been ex expropriated or Aryanized or uh, heirs of, of surviving forced enslaved laborers. It's 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 more difficult because there was this wholesale settlement uh, in 1999, but but even 70, 80 years on, there's there's there is. Um, there's still legal recourse. I think uh, if you have any other questions. Uh... We will have time after the. OK, yes. very important one, okay. please. Uh, sorry, thank you so much for writing this book. Uh, look, do you know if Dutch millionaires collaborate with German Nazi before the occupation and after the occupation. That's very important for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got a... There's been actually surprisingly little research about uh, the role of Dutch companies and uh, Dutch business families and their role in, the, in, uh, in, in their collaboration. Um, there, there, you know, you have the major industrialist families like uh, the ones that control SHV, for example, um, where the patriarch F.H. Ventner van Vlissingen, during my research, he was, for instance, the second largest shareholder at Harpener Bergbau in, in a rural area. And, you know, he was the founder of Axo Nobel, of KLM, um, you know, and, and he was very close to, to the regime. And there's never really been any good research about, about that uh, so far. Um, so I'm, I, I invite any scholar or economic historian to, to conduct that research. It, it won't be me, because I'm 
working as a Middle East correspondent, so I'm pretty busy at the moment, but uh, yeah. For other to support the right-wing movement here in Netherlands? Um, oh, I know, I mean, they're like, like in Germany, right? They're, I mean, you know, these families are con establishment conservatives. So whether they donate to the CDU in Germany, they donate to, you see a lot of these entrepreneurs or these business families give donations to the VVD. I mean, I provide the example in my book of the von Fink dynasty, where the father, the, the founding family of Allianz and Munich Re, where the father was, you know, an ideologue and really an, an ardent Nazi and Hitler uh, supporter, and where the son, who died uh, two years ago at the age of 91, was presumed to be, never proven so far, presumed to be the big backer in the early years of the AfD, of the Alternative for Deutschland, um, the far-right party in Germany. Um, and, and there, that is the only example of continuation from father to son of, of far-right thinking and support. You know, the, again, the others are conservative establishment, establishment conservatives. Uh, uh, and, you know, um, uh, yeah, which when they do speak publicly, it is often on these topics. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your questions. If you have any further questions, uh, you'll have a chance to ask them to David uh, privately. Now to wrap things up, uh, our final question would be, uh, what can we expect your next book to be about? Yeah, um, well, as I said as well, I'm, I'm a Middle East correspondent, so, so, so I don't think I have time to, to write a book for the next uh, few years. But um, I have an idea about a book which focuses already for three years, um, to f which focuses on um, American business dynasties with Dutch roots and kind of how they were influenced by... Calvinism, how it shaped the kind of far right, the right wing ideas, and and yeah, and uh, yeah. It's